Good morning. The topic of the day uh, is going to be in regards to uh, NFPA 70E, the new 2018 edition, and we're calling it what you need to know and why. And uh, I'm going to cover some of the changes, not all of the changes, uh, and, and certainly some sig what I consider to be significant implementation strategies. So here we go. My name is Mike Doherty. I'm uh, the, currently the uh, chair of the CSA Z462 standard, which is the Workplace Electrical Safety uh, Technical Committee since inception out of 2006. It is essentially, some people call it the, the Canadian NFPA 70E. Uh, there are some differences uh, and, and we'll see where that goes. I'm the president of my own company, Blue Arc. I'm an independent uh, consultant trainer for eHazard in Canada and a technical advisor for eWorkSafe in Canada. I do chair the Association of Electric Utility Safety Professionals professionals, the AUSP here in Ontario. I did work uh, 31 years at Ontario Hydro PG and Nuclear Power Generation Facilities, electrical skills instructor. I am a licensed electrician instrument tech. Uh, I do serve on the NFPA 70 working group article 130.4 and have been with them uh, for the vast majority since about 2007. Uh, the Canadians uh, do participate very actively on the NFPA 70 committee. As a matter of fact, we will be joining with them again this summer in regards to the 2021 edition of NFPA 70E and certainly Z462. I am a senior member of the IEEE, very involved with the, uh, the IEEE and, uh, uh, and on and on. So anyway, what are we talking about today? Uh, as I, I did note, it will be NFPA 70E, the 2018 changes and, and the ones that I think are important. When we get to the Certainly to the uh, implementation strategies, I'm, I'm going to uh, do that using some of uh, what we call the e-hazard uh, safety cycle in regards to electrical safety programs, uh, risk assessments, job safety plans, human performance, training maintenance, auditing, and incident investigations. The three that I really like to uh, talk about more than anything and I think are, are very, very important, uh, certainly job planning, uh, job safety plans is a new a new concept in uh, NFPA 70E 2018, I think, is just critically important and valuable. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to lean on that one a little bit. Also, risk assessments, risk assessment procedure, is something that I will touch on certainly significantly more. And uh, and certainly the step number two, which is the assessment of risk, is a new requirement. Uh, in NFPA 70 2018 that is uh, very valuable and, and I think has, has been missed any number of times. And then I really want to talk about human performance, which I think is kind of embodies uh, the standard and, and it brings real value to uh, using and implementing uh, NFPA 70 or certainly Z462 here in Canada. Uh, just the usual web webinar disclaimer. Uh, interpretations and opinions uh, used by myself, uh, they're mine, and, and you should not consider those to be an official position or presentation of any technical committee. The NFPA 70 standard needs to be used in its entirety to be effective. Uh, using any one section in isolation can lead to incorrect decisions at times. Person, people who use this standard need to be qualified and competent. So make sure you use your copy of 70E, and, uh, and we'll go from there. So some of the NFPA 70E 2018 changes. Uh, I do want to cover just a little bit on the history for those that are not sure. It is covered in the forward uh, reasonably well in NFPA 70E, but OSHA in 1975 put a request in. They, they just can't keep up, as we know, uh, even in January 2015, uh, within the, the high voltage world, they called it the 40-year rule. It took 40 years to make significant changes in the high voltage world. They, they just do not have the capability to move quickly. And they asked that uh, uh, 70E be instituted. So in 1976, you know, it's quite a while ago now, the 70E Technical Committee was formed. 1979, the first edition, part one came out. And, and essentially it was very much uh, a lot of information that came uh, from the NEC and, and they tried to gather as much safety information as they could, and they put it into 70E at the time. 81 uh, was second edition. 1983, third edition, they added part three. 1988, 70E, the fourth edition, was starting to put minor revisions. A lot of people were not using NFPA 70E even back in 88. 1995, I think, is when they, it really started to uh, take on a little more value to those in, in the workplace. Uh, 
the added limits of approach and the arc flash concepts were introduced, it was only really starting to become evident that arc flash energies were, were something that needed to be looked at far more uh, seriously. In the year 2000, six, uh, 76 edition, part four was added. Uh, 2004, again, to me, it, it was uh, a really valuable uh, edition. And part two became chapter one, part one became chapter four. They really started to rearrange it. And uh, people, you know, through the internet had more access even to obtaining a copy of 70 or being aware that it was even, even in the marketplace. Uh, safety related work practices were reorganized to emphasize working on live or energized parts as the last alternative, which is still one of the very most important tenets of, of 70E is to work in a de-energized state. Uh, and, and the constant reorganization has gone over the last couple of years uh, has been wonderful, but it has also been rather challenging for, for those who are trying to keep up. Uh, an energized electrical work permit and the related requirements were incorporated in 2004. 2009, the eighth edition, chapter four was deleted. Chapter four was very much the um, original 70E. Uh, it was a lot of the NEC pieces. Uh, and, and quite frankly, if you want to know what's in the NEC, you should go to the NEC. So it was deleted and, and that took some of the volume out of 70E, which, which was a good thing. And of course, in NFPA 70E 2012, the ninth edition, uh, that's when the hazard risk evaluation procedure which was in the standard at the time was revised to a risk assessment procedure. Uh, why would you go from hazard risk evaluation procedure to risk assessment procedure? Well, it was based on international standards trying to start to use common language and bring a lot of the international standards and international best case practices, those used in North America, and into a common language where we were not constantly reinventing the wheel. So it was a discussion of the separate but related concepts of hazard identification and risk assessment. Annex F, the hazard risk evaluation procedure was re replaced with the uh, risk assessment procedure. At that time in 2012, the concept of FR uh, was replaced by R created throughout the standard. I, I found that most people in the industrial, commercial, tech uh, worlds, they're happy to use the word AR the people that still have a really hard time uh, and, and use the concept FR are those in the high voltage uh, power line trade where they, where they use FR for a long, long time. Um, it, it's very evident all AR is FR, but not all FR is AR. And we'll see some, we get into a little uh, run on the PPE portion. Uh, we'll see that, you know, whether there is a difference. And then the hazard risk category table parameters located in the notes uh, to the body of the table. There is a, a big difference between the body of NFPA 70E, the annexes information, and certainly some of the, note, uh, the notes uh, below them, and they all have a little higher level of importance. In 2013, which was in between the 2012 and 2015 edition of NFPA, an ad hoc risk assessment task force was established by the NFPA 70E Technical Committee Chair, Dave Dinney. Why did they do that? They were trying to get the risk assessment piece pulled together. And, and this is what you're going to see uh, in the 2018 edition. You're going to see where a lot of this work that was started uh, literally almost five years ago is, is coming to fruition. It was to review the uh, use of the terms hazard and risk throughout the standard. Definitions are critical. Uh, you need to have clear definitions when you have technical discussions. And, and these are technical committees that, that put this standard together. We need to compare, compare to other standards, uh, propose the risk terminology and the definitions. Propose revisions to align NFPA 70E with those definitions and ensure consistent use of the terms. If you go back to 1976 and 1983 and 1988, the definitions used at the time quite possibly did not align with best practices. It was also to propose inclusion of a hierarchy of risk control methods consistent with other standards. ANSI Z10, CSA Z1000 in Canada, those are safety management system standards. And they are foundations for all of the work that we do in electrical. Uh, work that we do on, on, on any hazard should really start in safety managed system standards. And in the last bullet, you'll see where it says, Annex A in CSA Z462 and Annex P 
in NFPA 70E are basically aligning implementation of those standards with occupational health and safety managed system standards, which in fact, in the US, ANSI Z10, Canada, CSA Z1000, uh, BSI 18001 was another standard, British Standard Institute, all of these things coming together on a foundation of safety management standards. I always like to say, this isn't so much about electrical safety, it's about electrical safety management. How do you management? Manage your, sta your electrical safety in your place of business. That's always the true challenge. So in NFP 70, the 10th edition, there was four new edition, uh, four new definitions related to hazard and risk. A lot of that work came out of the ad hoc group in 2013. The entire document was revised, revised to ensure a consistent use of hazard and risk terminology. You can't have two and three concepts in a standard that do not align. Hierarchy of risk control methods was added as an informational note. What you'll find is as 70E progresses through its three-year cycles, there are incremental improvements, sometimes uh, significant uh, improvements. And in fact, for those of you that have seen the cover of NFPA 70E, 2018 on the cover is the triangle. And in fact, it is the hierarchy of risk control methods. So it's gone from uh, an informational note uh, right to the cover, and we'll talk about that today. Electrical safety program requirements were located to the beginning of Article 110. The electrical safety program requirements are important, and they've been moved up in importance and to make sure that everybody is aware. The electrical safety program required to be a part of the uh, em employer's occupational health and safety managed system, the OHSMS, when one exists. Again, it goes back to the annexes we talked about in CSA Z462 and in 70E, where in fact, health and safety managed system standards are critical. The prohibited approach boundary was deleted in 2015. Uh, it, it, it brought on no actions uh, when it was there. It was just a thing. It was it, we decided to get rid of it. The hazard risk category method in 2015 was deleted, but it, was, it wasn't deleted, it was revised to become an arc flash PPE category method, which was far more concise and clear in regards to what needed to be done in the field to execute real work. Uh, and hazard risk category zero was deleted, no need for it. Again, just uh, for your reference, uh, one of the things we did uh, in Canada, because I used to work in the nuclear power plants, we had, uh, instituted in 2015 uh, CSA Z462 Annex U, which was a human performance and workplace electrical safety. We put it in as a, a PI, a public input, to our friends and colleagues on NFPA 70E in 2015. They decided not to accept it at the time. Having looked at it for a couple of years in our Canadian standard, it is now, as one of the, the major changes in my view, NFPA 70E 2018 in their Annex Q, will reference human performance, which I believe is going to be very valuable on many levels. So here we go, NFPA 70E 2018. It is the 11th edition as, as we just uh, walked through that, that little history lesson, which I think is, is valuable in regards to how we ended up where we are today. What you'll see is they kind of have a new, uh, just on the bottom, I just put the bar in there in regards to 70E. 2018, what you'll find is shaded text in the standard are the revisions. If there is a shaded triangle, that's text deletions and figure table revisions. If there is a bullet, that are section deletions, and a shaded N will be for new material. Sometimes it is rather hard to determine what has changed from 15 to 18. Uh, they've put together uh, quite a nice little uh, routine with, with that new uh, new nomenclatures in 70E to let you know uh, what, what's been changed. So just to cover some of the changes, and there are many, that I, I tell you quite frankly, there are some very good sections on all the changes in NFPA 70E 2018. All you got to do is Google it and you'll see listings of them. What you need to do is find the ones uh, that well, they're all important, but find the ones that may impact your business. Uh, may impact safety in your business and and really root through them. We're going to touch on some of the ones that I believe are, are very important 
uh, in regards to a 70E18. So there, I already mentioned it, there's a new consideration, address potential for human error, it's new Annex Q. We will talk about it towards the end of this webinar today uh, to make sure that uh, you know exactly what's going on. The hierarchy of risk controls, uh, it, it's, it's not really new, but it uh, is now far more mandatory. And uh, what you'll find is the, uh, in the effectiveness, you know, to eliminate a hazard uh, substitution, right down to personal protective equipment, this is a hierarchy of risk controls. And I will talk about uh, where that gets implemented in the third step of risk assessment procedure, be it shock, uh, and or our flash, uh, and, and it's very much, it's a, you can see that on the cover of NFPA 70E18, that's exactly where the standards have come to. This to me, uh, in my view, and, and I, I put, you know, the little shadow figure, this is one of the biggest changes I feel personally uh, that you will see in NFPA 70E. Article 110.1, uh, job safety planning and the briefing expanded and clarified. That's exactly what's been going on with the standards. Uh, we've expanded the valuable articles and clarified it. So job safety planning or a JSP, if you look at it, it's a, the very first thing it has is that it will be completed by a qualified person. What I will suggest to you that if, if you go and you look at the qualified person definition in the front of 70E, you find there's 32 words. Often in people's electrical safety programs, they will determine that a qualified person at their place of business uses those 32 words. If you go on to pages 70E, 15, and 16, you will find in Article 110.2 uh, that a qualified person is in fact described by 382 words, almost 10 times more, more than 10 times more. So I would highly recommend that you clearly go when you're determining your qualification piece, go to 70E 15 and 16. It's, it's very important to ensure that people are actually qualified. Uh, this is the part, the second bullet, the job safety plan must be documented. If for years, people would do verbal uh, job safety planning, they would possibly discuss the hazards. It, it was never a requirement to be documented and it is very, very important. The world that I came from in the nuclear power plants, we always documented our safe work planning without question. Uh, it was just what we did. Um, it, it's very, very important. Uh, if it wasn't documented, it never happened. Included in that is a description of the job and the task, documented description of the job and the task. You need to identify the electrical hazards for each task. Uh, you will implement, if required, a shock an arc flash risk assessment. There are three steps, we'll cover them a little bit. And it also needs to include work procedures. And those are written, documented work procedures. What are the special precautions? What are the energy source controls? In fact, if you look at Annex J and 70E, uh, if you're doing energized work, you've pretty much just described an energized electrical work permit. In fact, the job briefing clause that was there before was a standalone. Now what it says in 70E18 is the job briefing shall cover the job safety plan, the new requirement, and the information on the energized electrical work permit if a permit is required. So when the job has been safely planned, safely documented, the job briefing portion shall cover the job safety plan. And, and it's, to me, it's a, a huge step forward, but it is also uh, a huge accountability for managers and supervisors. So I, I really, really uh, encourage you to go and read the job safety planning portion and of NFPA 70E, it, it's critical. Incident investigations, another, it's another new change. The electrical safety program shall include elements to investigate electrical incidents. And in the informational note, uh, it says, you know, anything that could, what does that mean? What's an electrical incident? Well, it, anything that could have resulted in a fatality, injury, damage to health. Importantly, it includes incidents referred to as close calls or what you might call a near miss, whatever you call it in your place of business. One of the most valuable things you can do is, is to document uh, leading indicators. Many places that I go to, they talk about uh, LTIs, they've had no loss, no time injuries. 
those, those are lagging indicators. Uh, if you haven't had an injury in, in the last 10 years of any kind, that's fabulous. The problem is how many near misses have you had? How close are you? So you need to do leading lagging indicators. Leading and lagging indicators are part of a quality safety management system, which obviously should include electrical as well as all the other hazards at your place of business. So you cannot be a leading or a learning organization if you're not doing quality incident investigation. It is critical. The standard 70E is now asking you in Article 110.1, Part J, to execute quality incident investigations to become, in my opinion, a learning organization. Clarity to the lockout tagout. Any electrical job anywhere, there are two decisions that need to be made, any electrical task. You need to do it in a de-energized state. Turn off the power, lock it, and tag it out. If you cannot do it because of infeasibility, you need to be able to uh, absolutely uh, be able to justify why you're doing it energized. Most of the time, all of the, as much as you can, you should be doing it in a de-energized state. Therefore, your lockout, tagout, written document procedures and training and execution in the field needs to be impeccable. Your single lines need to be correct. The equipment tagging in the field needs to be perfectly aligned with your electrical flow sheets, your single lines. Those two things need to happen and then you need to have a quality procedure that is uh, executed by people who really know what they're doing. So. From the 2015 edition of 70E to the 2018, uh, they really haven't changed the content as it says in the bottom right there, and the practices have not changed, but the structure of the information has been brought uh, clarity, it, it brings some clarity to the lockout tagout. I cannot emphasize enough how important your lockout tagout is. Everybody knows it, but when you ask a couple of questions about single lines, equipment identification tags in the field and their alignments, the training, the contractors that come in, often the lockout tagout process falls down very quickly. Have a look, uh, it's really, really important. The task tables have been moved and restructured. Uh, what you're going to find uh, is in regards to the, uh, the, two, uh, the two processes for doing arc flash quantification of energies in calories per centimeter squared, essentially to, uh, you know, the, one of the major factors is to pick your personal protective equipment that's appropriate to the hazard. There are two ways of doing it. There's the IEEE 1584 incident energy analysis method, for example, and there's also the arc flash PPE category method. And what they're trying to do is really emphasize the 1584 method, uh, the calculation method, and slowly but surely move the table method in, into the back, uh, into the annex piece. So that, that whole piece is moving on as well, trying to simplify as best they can and to restructure the way that that work uh, is, is uh, implemented in the field. The PPE for incident energy calculations, well, it was in Annex H. We know that the annexes don't have as much uh, importance uh, is, is one way of describing it as it does when it's in the front of the standard. So what's happened is they've taken uh, the table H.3B uh, and then moved it up to the front, uh, into the tables. Uh, table 130.5, Part G, the selection of our created clothing and other PPE when the incident energy analysis method is used. So it's moving up to the front uh, where it, it really should be. Uh, arc flash gloves is just another uh, another piece. Uh, heavy duty leather gloves may not meet a minimum of 12 calories per simplified methods. Arc rated gloves might be more likely in the future if you're simply opening or closing a 480 volt disconnect, for example, that's all covered up, covered up, no exposed parts, and, and certainly non-dominant hand rule techniques. Uh, you might determine that uh, because there is zero shock potential but you might want to wear an arc rated glove uh, as part of your shock risk assessment piece. Uh, there are new ASTM proposed arc rated protector glove standards. Standards are important. Standards are facts. St uh, opinions while interesting are not the facts and that's why using ASTM standards, 70 standards, CSA standards are very important and factual. 
some of the standards for PPE. Uh, it says, uh, you know, the P there's a conformance standard or a conformance uh, portion that is now in 70E 2018 is another change. Uh, in, in 2015, it said PPE shall conform to the standards listed in Table 130.7C14. Uh, it now it now says PPE shall conform to all applicable standards, state, federal, and local. Uh, certainly more things to look up. From a practical perspective, there, there shouldn't be any real difference, but someone could claim NFPA 70E uh, without testing. You need to deal with reputable vendors who are high-end when it comes uh, to using standards. Uh, if you uh, prefer to save a little money dealing with uh, vendors who are not uh, on the pointy end of the spear, you might not get what you like. So as usual, uh, really do your homework. Some of the other changes, auditing has been moved to multiple subject-based locations in Article 110.1, Part K, uh, as part of an electrical safety program, which should clarify. Bringing clarity to the standard is what the technical committees are really trying to do. Uh, it is rather painful now and over the last couple of editions as there's been so much change. But what I believe is that over the next, the, the uh, amount of change will start to drop off. Uh, certainly even in 2021, I think you'll see less change. And certainly uh, over the next X amount of time, the, change, the amount of change will go down and down and the standards will be very, very uh, accountable. They'll be nicely aligned, and all the uh, challenges that we, we are going through now because of, of, you know, quite frankly, massive change over the last three um, is going to make things a lot better for everybody. Uh, Article 110.2, the training's been shuffled to include all aspects, pulling some of the training clauses from some of the subject areas. Uh, global changes from mathematical symbols to words greater than was added, uh, and, and added definitions. Definitions are critical when it comes to standards. They've uh, defined what, what does it mean to have an electrical safety program? What do you mean by fault current, maintenance, working distances? These are the things that people need to know. So uh, some of the implementation strategies. Uh, we use this, this continual cycle piece. And in fact, it's, it's very close uh, to, well, it, it's based on uh, the plan, do, check, act cycles. It has been around for a long, long time. So uh, it's just used within when the electrical. So. Uh, if there's a, a safety cycle, is to define an end goal. What, what could you envision? Identify the methods and some of the milestones. Uh, how do you execute? I mean, there's the plan, do, check, act. Well, it's the execution in the field. Uh, you need to train the workforce. You need to implement. You need to measure and document. You actually have to go out and do something. Uh, the evaluation st stages. Analyze the measures against effective, uh, objectives, assess the effectiveness. Did you actually accomplish anything when you went out and executed? And then you, you, to be a learning organization, you have to evolve. You have to keep changing. It's the spirit of continual improvement, which is, in fact, part of the safety managed systems. Uh, you know, remediate, optimize, do what you need to do. Get it done. So if you, if you go forward looking at uh, doing this thing correctly, NFPA 70 2018, the electrical safety program is in Article 110.1, risk assessment 110.1, Part H, the training 110.2, investigations, audits, maintenance in Chapter 2. All these portions are getting clarified, reorganized, trying to make things easier and simpler. So within the electrical safety program piece, uh, there's many ways of doing it. Uh, my good friend, uh, Ray Jones, who was the chair of NFPA 70E for, for quite a while, and, and in fact, in my opinion, uh, was the gentleman who really, really uh, improved the standard and took it from a dusty document up on the shelf and turned it into something that people actually started to use. He used to say, make sure you have something. It doesn't need to be Star Wars, whether it's six pages, seven pages, or 100 pages, get something. So within the scope of your ESP, uh, you know, to address some of the uh, the elements. The risk assessments, again, we'll talk about them. Risk, uh, risk assessment procedures are critical. Shock and arc flash, any other hazards. It's not just electrical often. Uh, your contractors, to me, are, are one of the, the highest risk areas. Uh, they're not uh, within your culture. Sometimes they come for two, three weeks, two, three days. Uh, you really need to work with them to make sure that they do not get injured and or damage your equipment and certainly new installations uh, construction uh, all those kind of things training i already mentioned 
if you look at the 382 words on pages 15 and 16 of 70E, it clearly defines what it means to be qualified. Uh, and in fact, uh, the portion that is so important for training is Article 110.2, Part A, 1, C4, and Parts A, B, C, and D. If you're considered to be qualified, uh, even within those 382 words, it, it's my personal opinion that this that part on page uh, 16 in 70E, it says to be qualified, and, and I think it covers a lot of what's in 70E, and a lot of best practices have been captured within that one clause. And it says, do you have the decision-making process necessary to be able to do the following? Can you perform the job safety planning, the JSP? Can you identify the electrical hazards, direct contact, low voltage, high voltage, medium voltage, direct contact touch potentials? Are there any step potentials? Are there any flashover? What are the shock potentials? What are the arc flash hazards? You need to identify them. Can you assess the associated risk? And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. We now, in the 2018 edition of 70E, are asking you to quantify at a higher level, actually quantify the risk portion, can you select the selected or can you select the appropriate risk control methods from the hierarchy of controls, including personal protective equipment? That portion, A, B, C, and D of 110.2, A, 1, C, 4, in my view, is what makes a qualified person. It's really important, and I, I again encourage you to go and look at that. Uh, the investigations, the audits, if you're not doing audits, you truly, a documented audit, you really need to know what your people are doing. And the only way you're gonna do that, you need to go to the field and talk to them and watch them. That, and when you find something, it's a finding, it's not to be critical, it's to find the leading indicators and get things fixed before there is a problem. So the electrical safety program, you should bring in a team. There's many ways of doing it. I mean, it's really up to yourself. Is to train your workforce uh, to the qualification standards. Uh, you should have annual supervisory audits, three-year program audit investigations. It's based on standards, not opinions. Uh, the training itself, uh, electrical safety training, back to the decision-making process portion. Uh, it's based on the risk to your employees. It depends on what you're asking your employees to do. Uh, then they need to be able to make those decisions. Uh, risk stems from the hazards, shock and arc flash hazards. They need to be qualified. Energy control procedures, the lockout, tagout. Do you have an emergency response uh, training system set up if there is something happening at your at your uh, your plant or your business? You got to seek uh, subject matter expert input. Uh, typically, you've got really good people on your site who understand the work flow at site, um, they need to get on that. It's important. They got to conduct a training, spot checks, update content, uh, whatever it is they need to do. Uh, the audits already touched on it. Uh, very important, factual, uh, have the supervisors audit individuals. It's not to find fault. It's to find opportunities for improvement. So you got to set the scope. How do you plan? You got to plan the audits. You got to identify the method, whether it be supervisory, internal, external. Uh, conduct the audits, analyze, um, and again, it's that plan, do, check, act. Uh, you can literally run your uh, your child's soccer team, hockey team, football team using the plan, do, check, act, the envision, execute, evaluate, evolve. Uh, it's a really good way to execute just about anything. So it's something to consider. Maintenance in the field. Uh, the NFPA <clears throat> approach, uh, the National Electrical Code, NFPA 70, you know, they build it safely. NFPA 70E is to work on it safely, and of course, NFPA 70E is to maintain it safely, the maintenance standard. Uh, those three standards need to talk to each other. Uh, they are certainly not uh, the same, but they are aligned. It's really uh, critical to uh, execute your work programs using those three standards. So again, with that same uh, vision, execute, evaluate, you got to prioritize your equipment. Sometimes uh, you got to get to the really important 
uh, pieces, you know, the high voltage, low voltage, the age, establishing your, uh, your KPIs and the training needs, do the maintenance, analyze how it's working down, and then incorporate new equipment into the schedule, update your maintenance plans, make sure you're managing it correctly. Risk assessment, this is one I wanna lean on a bit more, uh, risk assessment procedure. The three steps is brought in in 2015 and to 70E and 462 uh, is to identify the hazards. Step two is assess the risks. Step three is apply the hierarchy of risk controls. In the perfect world, we could come up to our people and say, what are the three steps? And they will tell you. Identify hazards, assess, quantify risks, apply the uh, hierarchy of controls, and it doesn't necessarily need to be just in electrical. It can be for all hazards. The CEO should kick out these three steps, the middle managers, the supervisors, and the workers. And when they start to think using these three steps, we're now starting to use common language based on standards rather than opinions. So uh, in NFPA 70E 18, the risk assessment procedure, uh, a little deeper dive possibly in, into it, uh, at least my, my uh, thoughts on it. Uh, so uh, in Article 130.4 is a shock risk assessment. Uh, you need to know the voltage rating, the shock boundaries, the limited restricted boundaries, uh, what you're going to do. Ask you, go to, go to the field next time when you're standing with your electricians, as one example, and ask them, what do the limited and restricted boundaries actually mean? Is it just a distance or does it actually mean anything to them? And, and certainly in 70E, it gives you some, uh, some indication on exactly what you should be doing in the limited restricted boundary, what you should be doing in the restricted, uh, the restricted boundary within that distance. And, and the PPE for uh, shock is still a, a huge, huge issue uh, in, in the field. Uh, a lot of people want to talk about arc flash endlessly, which is important up to a point, but do not forget about the shock. Uh, the arc flash risk assessment, same thing. You're going to uh, execute uh, calculations, hopefully, to find your arc flash uh, energy, quantification, and calories per centimeter squared. Uh, some people do use the uh, arc flash PPE category method. They still need to know the upstream clearing device. They need to know the short circuit current and the distance to the arc. They still have to do some, some technical piece. If you're going to use that, you have to use uh, what's within the tables. Uh, the arc flash boundaries are important, uh, and and of course we're you know we're trying to find the PPE. Be aware, as most of you know, if you're not doing comprehensive maintenance as per your maintenance program, uh, in my opinion, your arc flash calculations are of very little value. If you're not doing comprehensive, high quality maintenance, uh, the tripping time your upstream clearing devices uh, are are at risk. Your whole uh, arc flash calculation is at risk. So. Make sure that you align maintenance with your calculations. Uh, identification of hazards, so important. Uh, it, it's uh, often, people say, well, it's 480, 600 volts, 4160, 138. Uh, we need to be able, in, in a quality job plan within a uh, job briefing, we need to clearly identify the hazards. It's important direct contact touch potentials, uh, sh any shock potential and quantified and clearly for each specific task, we need to identify those hazards. In incident investigations, when people get hurt, they often find people didn't even really identify the hazards, which is step one in a risk assessment procedure. Uh, assess the risks. This is the part that I believe uh, is another one of those things that's it's going to be uh, in 2018, 70E, it's changed. If you look in figure F.6, they have an example of a quanti quantitative two by two risk assessment matrix. Now it's not in color in 70E. I, I have this one here, so I threw, I threw it up just for a little better uh, for, the, for the webinar today, but it's, it's essentially exactly the same. If you think about uh, the likelihood of occurrence of harm as being improbable or possible, if the severity of harm, which is different, uh, is within the energy thresholds uh, in 70E, it's you know 50 volts. If it's less than 50 volts, uh, it is low. Uh, if the energy is higher than 50 volts, then you really need to consider it. And you need to start having the risk quantification discussions in a risk assessment procedure. Often the workers and the supervisors understand there are risks working on different pieces of equipment, but this is the piece 
that really needs to be documented in your job safety plan. In step two of a risk assessment procedure for shock and or arc flash, you need to really start to consider at whatever level uh, that is, is appropriate for your workplace, you need to be able to have the risk assessment piece and some uh, really important discussion and documentation around what that risk means. Quantifying the risk will change step three, which is in fact the hierarchy of risk control methods. So it's a, a really important change in my view in NFPA 70E 2018 is to start to have a comprehensive discussion about risk assessment and the quantification. And this, this uh, piece you see in figure F.6 is about as simple as it gets. There are some very complicated uh, risk assessment quantification methods too, which are uh, very interesting, but you can have to decide what works for your workplace. And of course, the implementation of the methods. Uh, this is, and again, it's the cover of NFPA 70E, uh, elimination substitution. So we'll, we'll have a quick walk through some of that. If it was elimination during a design phase, uh, that is the best practice is when you're designing new equipment before it's installed eliminate the hazards uh, it could be insulated parts separation of power control circuits some people believe elimination <clears throat> is the lockout tagout piece uh, and and some of these of these six uh, risk uh, control methods some of them do overlap and there is some discussion back and forth but that's okay we we want to have discussions and then we want to document in our job safety plans uh, certainly substitution uh, you can substitute the uh, the hazard uh, within uh, you know the one on the left the picture is a test circuit of 15 kV the arc resistant switchgear uh, is uh, on the right hand side arc resistant switchgear costs you more money but it is a wonderful substitution for normal gear and it is far far safer so something to think about going forward Mechanical controls can reduce hazard risk. You'll see the uh, the chicken switch kind of down in the bottom corner. The engineering controls, instead of standing right in front of the gear, you can put in uh, fast-acting switches, uh, infrared windows. There are many, many things you can do to reduce risks. And it's in the engineering controls, and it's far more effective than just wearing personal protective equipment. But it needs to be uh, sorted out uh, going forward. And it's based on identifi identified hazards, assessment of risks, and then these are the steps to control the risks. Awareness is, is an important part. Certainly the labels that you put on after an IEEE 1584 arc flash calculation, it gives you limited restricted boundaries, it gives you calories per centimeter squared and shock uh, values. Uh, just being aware can make a big, big difference, obviously. Certainly administrative controls, policies, procedures, training, maintenance, having to have a documented job safety plan is certainly uh, an administrative control. Uh, the arc flash studies themselves, um, these are important and mandatory for high quality electrical work. So PPE, I'm gonna, I will whip through these fairly quickly. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, you know, things you can do for PPE, but it, it, obviously it's the last line of defense, very important. Uh, and, and we'll just see where it goes. So, you know, dangerous clothing, you can't be wearing meltables. Uh, certainly, uh, we know, uh, you know, or for anyone who's been paying attention over the last few years, you know, that uh, you need to use arc rated clothing from high end vendors. Uh, very, very important. Uh, certainly, uh, you don't want to wear too much PPE. That means you're actually uh, managing it correctly and, and implementing by standards. So it's very important to not uh, wear any more PPE than you need, but that means you need to know what you're doing, and that is only done. Uh, with a shock and arc flash risk assessment procedure executed by qualified people. There's all kinds of specialty gear, hairnets and gloves and rain wear, certainly power linemen need to do that, uh, ASTM standards, there's some really good uh, information just with these standards here that are important. Uh, the PPE standards itself, uh, you can look at this later if you want, there are many, many standards <clears throat> rather than uh, just uh, dealing you know, uh, from the internet, get you know, if you need to purchase an ASTM standard, go get the ASTM standard. They are in uh, really sorted out through a long time. You can deal with the facts, 
talk to your vendors about the standards and, and ask them where you know where the standard sheets are it's uh, it's a good way to do business so uh, power plant electrician who's repairing uh, uh, you know to, to do some work uh, he, he was asked to drop a load out open one of the disconnects had a broken linkage decision made on the spot to fix the linkage screwdriver slipped obviously wasn't where uh, using uh, an arc or uh, a uh, a, a screwdriver, you know, non-conductive screwdriver, that kind of thing. So there's all kinds of lessons can be learned from these things. Uh, certainly, the uh, the gloves themselves uh, can uh, can burn. In fact, voltage-rated gloves with the rubbers are are really good. Obviously, shock and and very effective arc flash. Uh, in fact, the, there's never been a documented case of someone burning their hands if they had their gloves on. So uh, they are actually quite effective. Uh, the gloves themselves, uh, they do okay, and, and they've been standard, uh, standardized at testing. Some of the leather, leather glove requirements uh, are, are shown. There's EBT breakthrough, uh, arc thermal performance values, and they actually do quite well. Uh, there are all kinds of incidents around the world uh, where people are not wearing the right things, so make sure and wear your voltage-rated gloves. They're outstanding for shock and arc flash. Uh, there are shock and arc rated gloves. There are cut only. They now have shock, arc rated, and cut resistance gloves. Go and check out uh, some of the products if that's what you need. Same thing here: uh, shock, arc rated, cut resistant, but not uh, not. You got to buy products that do uh, that match your task uh, and your risk assessments. So the underwear question: same thing. Uh, make sure. Uh, you know that you've done a risk assessment and wear undergarments appropriate to the work that you do. They they cannot be multiples uh, without question. Uh, cotton is okay as long as there's no break open risk as as normal. Uh, certainly, some of the uh, the women's garments uh, need to be thought about as well. If you've got women in your workforce, you've got to do that risk assessment procedure. Uh, hair and beard nets, same thing. Certainly, some of the uh, the high vis uh, the ANSI standards are important. So uh, there's ASTM F2302 has been withdrawn. Uh, very, very important, again, uh, to make sure you're using the correct standards. The ASTM 1891 is 1506. Jump into the standards. Find out what's going on. Uh, polyester fall protection. This was a, a lanyard that... Uh, that ignited uh, and actually burned. They didn't fall, but they were burned by the fall protection. Uh, if you are in a facility where you need arc rated fall arrest and lanyards, make sure you have it. There are standards for it. Uh, and ASTM F887 uh, are important. Same thing here, there are arc rated tests that have all been done, so be aware. Layering. Uh, tuck button and roll, make sure they're laundered correctly, go to the standards, find out what it is that you need. FR and AR, I touched on it earlier. Uh, it's important, again, uh, to make sure that it is ARC rated. They got rid of it in 70E 2012 because the term FR was misused in so many terms. Uh, you can, in fact, uh, melt FR uh, if there is an incident. Uh, pressure waves are important. You'll see here quickly, the uh, this is a mannequin, 20,000 Ka, 10 cycles, less than six calories. Watch the disc in air and, and the, the mannequin arm flying by. You need to do the energy calculations to determine your risk assessment. This one is, is mostly about arc blast as a function of fault current for sure, but containment is a more critical factor. You'll see on the left, uh, that the mannequin with a contained blast and an exact same energies uh, on the right uh, without containment. Again, risk assessment procedure based on the risks. The risks are different in a contained fault and an open fault for blast. So incident investigations, I'll go through this fairly quickly. Uh, there's procedures, case studies, uh, electrical safety program shall now include, this is new in 18, 2018, to investigate electrical incidents, and we did touch on why. So you got to determine the ground rules, the mapping, the an uh, analysis phase, and a preventative phase. This is where you become a learning organization. 
You can ask any number of questions. You've got the, the pre-planning is very, very important. Who's doing the investigation? How are you being investigated? When do you start and stop? This is uh, very, very critical to your organization, and it is new in 2018. So the mapping phase, the analysis phase, the investigation techniques, questions, ask the five whys if required. Preventive phase, the investigation reports, action implementation, tracking, verification, due diligence, close out. You cannot learn from incidents, even if no one got hurt, if you don't do these things. So corporate procedures, you really should have this in place and, and get going on it. Um, investigation procedure itself can include any number of these uh, types of process. Investigation report checklist, again, best case practice for incident investigation. And I want to touch on human performance just the last few minutes of the webinar to uh, just, and, and it's a, a big change. Uh, I put this in, this is something I did years ago, uh, probably 15, 16 years ago, I was always in, really interested in root cause. And the concept, you know, here in, in this very old presentation from 15, 16 years ago was the cover sheet. Uh, you know, if those are electrical safety problems, uh, and, and you're knocking them down, you know, the farmer would walk up and say, do you know why there's so many electrical safety problems down there? Well, there's, there's grubs, you got to dig them out, you got to do root cause investigations. So uh, if you ask why, kind of a six sigma piece, you ask why six times in a row to the same question, you start to get to the root cause. Uh, and, and it's a, a very fascinating journey, quite frankly. Uh, we benchmark some of the medical industry. They have lots of root cause that they do. Uh, the airline industry back in the 80s in the U.S. did a lot of benchmarking when they were having some significant incidents specifically at that time. Uh, certainly the U.S. Nuclear Navy has done a lot of benchmarking uh, of, of the medical and uh, certainly the, uh, uh, the airline industry. A lot of the people use, uh, would leave the U.S. Nuclear Navy, would end up in U.S. nuclear power plants. Uh, right across North America, certainly in our uh, our nuclear power plants here in Ontario, we, we ended up with the same thought process. All of those were put into CSA Z462 2015. We have an eight-page human performance annex was put together by a group of world experts, which has now just been instituted in NFPA 70E18. Uh, we're really pleased. I think it's uh, it's important. Uh, people are fallible. Error-likely situations are predictable. Identify common causes, apply to lessons. Uh, they're influenced by organizational processes and values. Walter Deming, who in fact put the Plan, Do, Check, Act piece in place, said a bad system will beat a good person every time. I absolutely believe that. Uh, you don't assign blame. What you want to find when something happens, don't assign blame. Identify the common causes and situations and go and fix it with human performance tools. I, I think in 70E18, is just it's a, a quantum step in improvement. I will not read through this whole portion, but there are human performance tools, and I do want to point out the top part. Job planning, pre-job briefing, post-job review, procedural use and adherence, bold it down further. These portions are what you document in a job safety plan. So there's a real alignment and a piece where all these components of a quality safety management system is being pulled together in 70E. So in conclusion, some of the NFPA 70E 2000 changes, we didn't cover them all. They're, they're all over the place. Uh, we, we tried to put it in place a little bit with some of the, the uh, safety cycle piece that we have. Uh, just touched on the safety program, the risk assessment procedures. These are procedures. They're not just a concept to execute. Identify, identify your hazards, assess and quantify your risks, trying to use that table or that figure F.6 concept in your place of business, job safety plans. There is now a requirement to document and write down those pieces. Human performance, it's a whole webinar into and of itself. It's so important and so valuable. Uh, and when you talk about root cause, if you ask why five or six times and keep asking why, almost always, in my opinion, it gets to a human performance issue. And human performance issues are not just for workers or supervisors. You can have human performance issues right up through the management chain. So everybody has to be accountable 
and go and get it fixed. Obviously, you need to be trained and qualified. You need to do maintenance or your arc flash studies are, are next to useless. You need to audit in the field. If you're not auditing, you don't know what's going on. And if you want to be a learning organization, you need to do comprehensive, high-end incident investigations. What I believe is good safety is good business. I thank you very much. I can tell you that uh, if you have any questions, uh, any concerns, you can email me uh, at mike.doherty at e-hazard.com and we will help you out. Thank you very much.